Hi, welcome to Yuskogans, the International Law Podcast. In this very special episode, uh, we will explore the theory and practice of treaty interpretation uh, generally and shed light on the methodology behind drafting ICRC's updated commentaries to the 1949 Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols. For this purpose, I'm joined by an esteemed panel. Uh, in no particular order, I'll introduce them. So first, we have Dr. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Linzad, uh, who is an in-doubt professor of public international law. Uh, she is also a judge at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Uh, prior to ITLOS, uh, she acted as an agent in cases before the ICJ, uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and also the ICC. Uh, she's a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration and also the San Remo Institute of International Humanitarian Law. Uh, secondly, we have uh, Dr. Sean Murphy, who teaches, writes, and practices in the fields of public international law and U.S. foreign relations law. He is the professor of international law at the George Washington Law School. He has argued several cases before the international courts and tribunals, uh, including ICJ, Iran US Claims Tribunal, ICTY. Uh, he is also currently an ad hoc judge uh, to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, uh, a member of the UN uh, International Law Commission, and a former president of the American Society of International Law. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Dr. Jean-Marie Hankarts, uh, who is a legal advisor in the legal division of ICRC, International Committee of the Red Cross, and head of project to update the commentaries on the 1949 Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols of 1977. Uh, prior to this, he was the head of the ICRC project on customary international humanitarian law. Uh, thank you so much uh, to my uh, esteemed panelists for joining me today in this uh, very special episode. Uh, so uh, in today's discussion, just to give a bit of a structure, uh, we will discuss the main elements of the general rule on treaty interpretation uh, in Article uh, 31 of the uh, Vienna Convention. Uh, we'll talk about the elements of uh, good faith, ordinary meaning of terms uh, in their context, object and purpose, subsequent practice, and other relevant uh, rules of international law. Uh, this would be supplemented by supplementary means of interpretation in Article 32, of the same convention uh, that can be used to confirm the meaning based on Article 31 or to determine the meaning when the meaning has remained ambiguous or obscure based on the general rule. Uh, on this basis, uh, participants will each address uh, different parts of this framework and we'll see how the conversation goes. I uh, hope you guys enjoy this one. Uh, so I'll first start with uh, Professor Elizabeth Linzad. Uh, thank you so much for being uh, on the podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Uh, just to get the conversation going, uh, can you give us uh, an overview of why treaties need to be interpreted uh, to begin with? Yes, uh, I'm happy to do so. And, and thank you very much for, um, for inviting us. I'm very happy to be here uh, and to discuss the interpretation of treaties as it is particularly relevant to our work as international lawyers. Now, why do treaties need to be interpreted? I think all of that starts out with the fact that the main tool that law uses, including international law, is language. Without language, written treaties would not exist. And that means that some of the unclarities that come with language in general may also so play a role with respect to understanding what the provisions are meant to achieve. Uh, what are the rights and obligations within treaties? Many provisions may be straightforward and clear. When you read them, it is quite clear what the intention is. And so consequently, they do not require specific interpretation. There is no need to interpret rules that do not require interpretation because they're clear. Um, if they say one thing, that implies that they exclude another thing, another implementa uh, interpretation. But it is not always that simple. Language can be ambivalent, it can be imprecise, or it can be leading to confusion when we read a particular treaty text. And this is when we get into the question of treaty interpretation uh, and this is why we need Articles 31 and 32 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. These provisions are meant to give us a methodology to assist us with the interpretation of those rules. Rules are normally written in a general man manner in a treaty. A generic norm is given to be applied in a particular category of situations, particular category of uh, types of cases. 
For example, uh, when enemy combatants have been detained in a prisoner of war camp, they, these will, the treaty Gen, uh, GC3 uh, would provide general rules that will be applicable in that situation. We, know, we may know which rules are relevant, but before they are applied, it will be necessary to consider how they should be understood in this particular situation or with respect to this particular person. So interpretation is the process aimed at understanding a rule. It should lead to establishing what is meant uh, by a particular rule and what exactly were the drafter's intentions. What consequences can be drawn from a provision when we read it with a particular situation in mind? So to a certain extent, interpretation takes us from the general rule to its application in a concrete situation, the more specific situation. Uh, so thank you for that uh, you know, very comprehensive uh, overview. Uh, so in your opinion, uh, who primarily interprets uh, treaties and uh, who, what are the actors whose interpretations are legally binding? Uh... Well, you know, uh, to start out, that's a fairly general question. I think when we read a treaty in our mind, we all start to interpret that treaty. So a simple answer would be that everybody concerned who reads a treaty uh, will be reflecting on what is the precise meaning of the norms that are before you. That's a very broad answer. Uh, so let me explain. I think interpretation is a mental, analytical, and I hope very precise process that lawyers use when reflecting about norms and what such norms would mean in a particular situation. But I think we must distinguish between different roles and different types of legal activities in which interpretation plays a role. So, uh, for instance, when a um, situation calls for the uh, application of particular rules of international law, the states concerned thus must interpret the rules that are relevant in that situation. Government lawyers, whether they are military lawyers or defense lawyers or lawyers in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or other in other positions, will analyze provisions and will determine how they consider a provision should be understood or in a colloquial uh, a term, how they should be read. So initially, interpretation is necessary for the legal analysis of a state's own position, given the need for governments to act within the law. So it's such an analysis of applicable international legal rules must also take place when drafting implementing legislation, drafting military manuals and other instruments relating to a state's international legal obligations. And also perhaps during hostilities with respect to a specific situation that has arisen. Interpretation also has a role in the critical assessment by states of their own actions but it will also be necessary when discussing the application and implementation of the law with other states. For example, when your opponent indicates that they consider that your state has violated the law or has misrepresented the applicable norms. In such, such situations, there may be disagreement about facts on the ground, but equally there may be a true disagreement about how to read, read the norms to which both parties have adhered. Exchanging views on the interpretation of the relevant norms will then be a key component in dispute settlement. In a further phase, if you have been unable to sort out the difference of opinion about the interpretation of the norms with your opponent, the matter may end up before a court or a tribunal. Here again, the judges will analyze the facts of the case and then interpret the provisions concerned and establish how these must be understood, how they must be read in a given situation. And in doing so, judges also rely on the rules in articles 31 and 32 of the Vienna Convention. Eventually, 
following the litigation and the interpretation of the rules of law applicable in that case, the decision will of course be binding on the parties in the case. However, as we all know, depending on the content of the decision and depending on the authority of the judicial body, uh, the judicial body that took the decision, and such decisions may also influence the interpretation of rules for those who have not been parties to the case themselves. Now, more in general, uh, there are a few other aspects to be mentioned, is that interpretation is also, I think, at the heart of academic research and scholarly writing. Researchers will often be analyzing the law somewhat removed from the individual incidents and take a broader view and perhaps compare state practice. They may raise more general questions as to the meaning of um, a particular provision and its interpretation, which may eventually influence the way in which a rule is interpreted in the future. And a final a type uh, of more generic interpretation, and I think the reason why we are having this debate today is the interpretation that is provided in commentaries to certain treaties. Such commentaries, and of course we know the commentaries to the Geneva Conventions, but there are many other types of commentaries to major uh, international treaties, and they in part rely on the drafting history of provisions, build on the subsequent practice, as well as of uh, built on developments in related areas of, of law. The aim of such commentaries is to provide a broader insight into the interpretation and the meaning of the individual provisions of a treaty in the context of the whole of the legal instrument, the thinking behind the formulation of the provisions, including choices made during the formulation and the drafting of the text, and how the treaty has um, been understood since its entry into force. Now, commentaries, of course, are a tool. They are a resource for practitioners and academics and anyone who wants to know more about those instruments. They're not the law itself. Um, and for that reason, I think it is uh, relevant to, to just uh, briefly look at the text of Article 31, uh, 31 paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention, which tells us the general rule, the starting point is that a treaty shall be interpreted in good faith, in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms of the treaty in their context and in the light of their object and purpose. Uh, I think um, good faith is a... Um, is, is an overall universally applicable requirement for the conduct, conduct of states. So perhaps that's not one to necessarily focus on. Uh, and the, the context, I'm not sure, is, is uh, uh, necessarily very problematic either. But the ordinary meaning and the object and purpose, I think, are uh, issues that, that um, deserve some more attention. Right. Uh, before I prod you further, uh... I like to uh, I like to ask uh, Dr. Sean Murphy to weigh on this fundamental question: whose uh, interpretation matters and why? Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, to join the podcast, and it's a great pleasure to to not just be here with you, Omar, but uh, with such esteemed uh, co-panelists. Um, I, I pretty much agree with everything that uh, Elizabeth just said. Um, I, I guess I would stress that, unfortunately, in many instances, there will not be a legally binding decision or judgment that resolves a particular interpretive problem. One would hope that you could get before an arbitral tribunal or an international court, um, and in some instances, a national court as well, uh, to, to receive a legally binding interpretation, but uh, often that will not be the case. And so I think Elizabeth's comments that um, one very important aspect of this is simply governments themselves sitting down and trying to understand what is their right or obligation in a particular context uh, is, is central to this uh, interpretive process. 
and we rely on governments in good faith to, to abide by their treaty obligations. So certainly in my time in government, and I'm sure that's true of Elizabeth and as well, um, on a daily, almost daily basis, you would be having to interpret uh, your treaty obligations. And uh, I like to think that 98% of the time you do it in a manner that's consistent with the way other governments are interpreting uh, the provision as well, and it keeps the system working. Um, unfortunately, we do have sometimes disputes that will arise. Often we can't put them before binding dispute resolution, and so they just sort of sit there until over time perhaps there's, there's a resolution. But um, uh, when you can get before a court or a tribunal, of course, you could get a, a binding decision. If I, if I can, Omar, I might also um, just step back for one moment and, and note that we're talking in this podcast about the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties in Articles 31 and 32. Uh, that is, of course, itself a treaty. And that treaty itself sometimes needs to be interpreted. So it, it's an interesting element. But, but beyond that, um, there are currently 116 states parties to the VCLT. Uh, that means out of 193 countries, about a third are not actually a party to the VCLT, which means that they aren't bound as a matter of treaty law to Articles 31 and 32. Moreover, in relations between parties to the VCLT and non-parties, the VCLT does not operate as a matter of treaty law. And even among the VCLT parties, the treaty does not apply, strictly speaking, the VCLT does not apply, strictly speaking, except to treaties that were concluded after the point at which the VCLT has entered into force for the VCLT parties. All of which is to say that there's an issue here about what to what extent Articles 31 and 32 that we're talking about in this podcast reflect customary international law. Because in many instances, maybe even in most instances, you are going to be applying these rules as a matter of customary international law. The good news in this regard is that it's pretty much universally accepted that Articles 31 and 32 are reflective of customary international law. The International Court of Justice has said that on many occasions. Other courts and tribunals have said it, even non-parties to the VCLT. And I come from the United States. My government is not a party to the VCLT, but it has said on numerous occasions, including before the International Court of Justice, that it regards Articles 31 and 32 as customary international law. So I think we can sort of push that issue to the side, but I did think that it was worth raising um, in the course of this initial conversation. Right, now that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and thank you for you know, being on the podcast. Uh, before I come back to you, uh, Professor Elenzad, I want uh, you know, a, a bit from uh, Dr. Henkartz about the same problem. Why do we need, uh, you know, legally binding interpretations and whose interpretations actually matter? Yes, thank you, Umer, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's also a pleasure for me to be here, and I'm very happy to be on this uh, program together with distinguished professors and practitioners, academics and practitioners, such as Professors Murphy and Lanzat. Um, what I want to add on this point is, um, in, in reply to your question is, yeah, as, as Lisbeth Lanzard has said, when you read a treaty, you're interpreting. I mean, interpretation is necessary because we're working with language and language requires interpretation. So simply reading a treaty or for that matter, any other international document, at the moment you're reading, you're interpreting. And so anyone who has to work with treaty law has to interpret. And that includes not only states because, and not only academics, but also many other, uh, um, many other people, for example, staff of international organizations when they're working on resolutions and also staff of the Red Cross and Red Crescent and uh, members of NGOs, for example, who also work with treaties in the field of human rights or environmental law or in the field of law of war. 
So, and what is specific for uh, the organization I work for, the International Committee of the Red Cross, is that our work is based on the statutes of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. And those statutes uh, provide that we have to work for the faithful application of international humanitarian law. So that means that we have to, in any given situation, of course, know what those rules are. And when we open the books and look at the treaties, then we are interpreting and we have to know how we interpret specific provisions. That also goes back to what Professor Lanezad said, that once you open the treaty you're interpreting, and then once you start to apply to a specific situation, you have to interpret the treaty and go from the general to the specific, because you can look at the Third Geneva Convention, for example, on prisoners of war, but then when a particular conflict breaks out, let's say like recently between Armenia and Azerbaijan, involving the taking of prisoners of war, or before between Eritrea and Ethiopia, as Professor Murphy knows uh, very well from his work on the Eritrea-Ethiopia Claims Commission, when you then apply the, the rules of the Third Geneva Convention to a specific situation, you have to go from the general, the rule that is laid down in the treaty, to applying that to a specific provision, and that goes through the process of interpretation. So, so there are many actors involved in interpretation. Uh, states give what is usually recognized as an authentic interpretation, since they're the, the makers of international law. Uh, they can also issue authentic interpretations. But the challenge, of course, we, we face today in many cases is that we're dealing, in the case of the Geneva Conventions, with uh, universally ratified treaties, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, but we have many state parties, and so it is difficult, of course, to get universally agreed interpretations adopted in a specific forum. So, uh, so legally binding interpretations might come from, from court decisions, but even so those decisions um, in, in principle are only binding between the parties to that, to that dispute. But of course the decisions of the courts will have a wider impact. And that is just to say that of course, uh, when we then issue commentaries on the Geneva Conventions, those are not by no means, uh, of course, binding. They're not the law as Professor Lainbad said, Lainbad said, they don't change the law. The binding law remains the Geneva Conventions. The interpretations that are given uh, in documents such as commentaries are meant to be tools for practitioners to use. And so in many cases, it will be uh, government officials, state lawyers, um, legal advisors in armed forces in international organizations, as I said, and also in the Red Cross and Red Crescent and NGOs that will on a daily basis have to interpret uh, the conventions that they're working with. And so it's a, it's a fantastic field. Um, and it's also, I think, quite fortunate that we have the framework of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, because at least we have a basis from which to start our investigation and on which to to base our discussions when, even when we disagree on the interpretation, there's something we can fall back on. We have the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and, and even though we can argue about the meaning of those terms in itself, as Professor Murphy said, we can even interpret articles 31 and 32. But I would say it is very fortunate that today we, we have that framework and that is generally recognized as we heard as customary international law. Thank you. Great, thank you for that elaboration, you know, from a broader organizational perspective. Coming back to you, Professor Lenzad, uh, in terms of uh, interpretation under the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties, uh, you briefly spoke about the ordinary meaning of the terms of a given treaty. Uh, so how is the ordinary meaning of the terms of a treaty established? Yes, thank you. I think that that's an interesting question because it is the starting point of interpretation um, and the starting point I think that is also related to the uh, the, the notion that interpretation uh, should take place in, in good faith the starting point for interpretation is that words in the text have their ordinary meaning unless it is clear that something else was meant perhaps something more specific than would normally be covered by a particular term. Now specific meanings or meanings that deviate from the ordinary meaning 
maybe, for instance, in definitions. A definition in a treaty is, after all, a, a method of determining the exact scope of a particular term when it is used in that particular treaty. Or uh, it may be that a specific meaning that is not the same as the ordinary meaning uh, may be established through looking at the drafting history uh, of the treaty, or perhaps uh, subsequent practice may demonstrate that. Now, I will leave all these issues for Professor Murphy to discuss in a little while, but the starting point is uh, ordinary meaning is words have their ordinary meaning when they are used in a treaty. Now, you may not be precisely certain about what that ordinary meaning is. So normally the step is to use a dictionary, uh, and by saying a dictionary I mean a good dictionary, probably not of Google Translate, but a more profound source than that. And at times it is also useful to compare different dictionaries because they might give you uh, the nuance that you're looking for. The ordinary meaning issue obviously also comes down to the matter of lawyers employing language as the main tool for the obligations. And there, I think we have to be aware of the fact that treaties are sometimes negotiated in various languages at the same time, which is what you may see the UN do, where they are using six languages and lots and lots of translators and interpreters to draft a particular treaty, or treaties may have been drafted in one language only. I believe the Geneva Conventions were negotiated in French, but I stand to be corrected by Jean-Marie if, if that's not, this, if that's not uh, the correct uh, recollection. So um, you may also want to check the language uh, that was used during the negotiations to help you find the ordinary meaning, or at least the meaning that was intended by the drafters. Now, there is a little bit, bit of a trick here. Treaties will normally state something along the lines that the treaty is authentic in these or that, this or that language. So, for instance, in article, I think it's 133 of GC3, you will find that the convention is equally authentic in French and English. That's not the same thing as saying that those, lang uh, those treaties were negotiated in both languages. It may be that the drafters decided in the end that the treaty had to be, um, had to be authentic in two languages and so decided at, towards the end of the negotiations to have a, a translation made of the treaty. And this happens from time to time that if you compare the various authentic language versions of a treaty, you may find that in the same provision, um, the sentences don't really track, or I have once seen a, seen a situation where the English and French language version of a particular uh, treaty had in one paragraph, crucial paragraph, that's how we learned, they had three sentences and the Spanish translation only had two and a crucial sentence was missing, which led to huge confusion in the proper interpretation of the obligation because the obligation had more elements in English and French than it had in Spanish. So have a good look if it really matters, try and see if you can, can find the different language versions and try and compare. Of course, you will need people that are able to master the various languages. And here we get to another problem in terms of ordinary meaning. You have to keep in mind that many people, particularly in the field of international law, are not working in their mother language. So they may be actually quite good at using the English language but the odds are that their knowledge of the English language is still less precise than the knowledge of their mother tongue. So many of us come to treaty interpretation with another language than our mother tongue and with another language 
of the languages that are equally authentic according to that treaty. So uh, I think these are sensitive issues. Um, I don't think there is necessarily a, a solution to that, but for me, it is also a matter of the awareness that although everybody may be speaking English, um, their understanding is perhaps not always going to be the same because the nuance in another language for someone to pick up that nuance, the detail, uh, is a difficult one. Uh, I'll pick your brain again on another element of general rule of treaty interpretation, uh, which is the object and purpose of a given treaty. So my question to you, uh, Professor Lenzad, is how is the object and purpose of a given treaty identified? Yeah, let me put it like this. I think that is a crucial question, but it is perhaps one of the most complex questions. Now, um, what exactly is the object and purpose? What do we mean when we speak about object and purpose? It is a notion that points us to the core idea behind a particular treaty. It asks, what was the goal of the drafters? What did the drafters want to change in international law as compared to pre-existing international law? What was their key intention with this treaty at the time of drafting? What was added as compared to earlier law? Now, this notion of object and purpose, I think, more or less first arrives on the stage in the ICJ advisory opinion on the Genocide Convention in 1951, which is a uh, advisory opinion with respect to the rules on reservations to treaties. And there you see the ICJ using the notion of object and purpose as a sort of core obligation in the treaty amidst all the written rules. So um, it is, it looks like a very obvious norm. Uh, states should refer to object and purpose uh, as, a, as a core norm when they interpret uh, a treaty provision. They should refer to object and purpose as a core norm when determining whether or not uh, a reservation is acceptable. So it looks like a fairly obvious norm as something that is more or less self-evident. But it is, I think, quite complex when you look uh, at the detail of it. Object and purpose is understand to be a combined whole, sort of a unitary concept. It is one norm, although Literally speaking, it has two components. Um, it's the raison d'être of the treaty. It is the essential or perhaps even existential reason for the existence uh, of a particular instrument. And I think um, that also goes to the fact that for every treaty, there must, it must have somehow an object object and purpose. There is a reason why treaties exist. States just do not go about uh, agreeing treaties. There is a reason they want, wish to achieve something with that treaty. But what is unfortunate for those of us who are referred to the use uh, of, of the notion of object and purpose is that states are rarely explicit about what object and purpose is. I found one, I think, good example of a description of object and purpose, which is Article 1 uh, of the Charter of the United Nations, which says the purposes of the United Nations are, and then we get a list of four points, and those are apparently, it's sitting at the beginning of the Charter, those four points, I'm not going to read them out, but those four points are the heart of the matter, these are the issues that states sought to address in agreeing the Charter of the United Nations. But as I said, it is quite rare for states to uh, identify specifically 
this is the object and purpose of my new treaty. This is the heart of the matter. I do note though that there are some contemporary treaties, I would say mostly um, the ones that I found mostly in the field of environmental law, where somewhere in the early provisions, such as, uh, you know, Article 2 or 3 or something like that, uh, treaties would have uh, provisions that are entitled objectives, which is also summary of the key things we wish to achieve in this uh, particular treaty. Um, but Regrettably, it's rare for states to be explicit about object and purpose. Now, uh, that's unfortunate, particularly given the fact that Article 31 of the Vienna Convention and other provisions in the Vienna Conventions uh, refer to object and purpose. So um, the uh, idea is that at times it is useful to have a look at the preamble. Preamble is where the drafters uh, tend to um, summarize the goals and ambitions they have with respect to that particular treaty. But um, maybe we should not get our hopes up, up too high. Sometimes preambles are extremely long and very political with lots and lots of ideals, but nothing much in terms of content of or direction. If you look at um, the preamble of the Law of the Sea Convention, there's a lot of information there, but it doesn't single out anything specifically as the, um, as, as the object and purpose of that convention. Or we may be in a different situation where we cannot look at a preamble because there simply is not a preamble or there is no preamble of substance. So either there there are lots of, uh, there's a lengthy preambles where you really have to look very carefully to find object and purpose, or there simply is none, such as in the Geneva Conventions. Well, there is an introductory text, but I hesitate to qualify that really as a preamble. So that makes it quite difficult when you want to use Article 31 and its yardstick of uh, object and purpose. Um, th this, I think, uh, implies, and it, it's a bit of, um, a, of a circular thing, this implies that when you wish to um, interpret the Geneva Conventions along the lines uh, suggested by Article 31, uh, you may end up in a situation where, uh, for the interpretation of the provisions of the Geneva Conventions, if your starting point is your desire to use the norms, the rules in Article 31 of the Vienna Convention, it is necessary to analyze um, the uh, relevant Geneva Convention and establish what, uh, the, what its object and purpose may be. Now, this is something that is done, I think, quite well in the introduction, introductory part of the convention, the new revised commentaries to the convention, where the introduction uh, provides clarity on the analytical steps taken to formulate uh, to, uh, on the basis of an interpretation of those conventions, their object and purpose. Um, the difficulty that people may comment on is that in fact, in order to have uh, a sense of what the object and purpose of the Geneva Conventions is, you use article, it's necessary to use article 31 in order to do that analysis to end up with object and purpose that you need as a part of the use of article 31. So there is something circular in that, uh, as, as I said before, I don't really see how else that can be done. Um, However, I must say, I have recently seen a publication where the author expressed concern about the uh, revised GC3 commentary and said that it was substituting the ICRC's interpretation of the object and purpose of the convention when the original drafters specifically declined to do so. I think the author means something along the lines of there is no explicit mention of an object and purpose of GC3 and no 
useful preamble in which we may be able to find the object and purpose. So the drafters have left us more or less with empty hands, if you could put it like that. And the author seems to suggest that as a consequence of that, there is no object and purpose of that convention, um, rather than accepting, as would be my choice, uh, to accept that finding the object and purpose of that convention is a matter of treaty interpretation itself. Now, I find this position of thinking that there is no object and purpose because uh, the drafters did not manage to come to an agreement uh, on a more substantive preamble during the negotiations, I find that position difficult to accept. Well, the, the, my first argument is, is more of a practical one. Um, object and purpose, as I mentioned, appeared first uh, in the advisory opinion on genocide, on the Genocide Convention, which is in 1951. The conventions are from 1949. Um, but for me, it's a larger issue. It is very difficult to understand how, how one could accept that there is a particular convention that has no object and purpose at all. Either you say, well, everything is hugely important, it was just a new convention. They did a new convention. Well, they did a new convention. Um, but um, I would think there is always a key driver for states to embark on work of such a scale as drafting the four Geneva Conventions. There is a reason behind that, which is the raison d'être, the core aim that states she seek to achieve. Um, for me, object and purpose is a fundamental cornerstone of the law of treaties uh, without, uh, and, and it is difficult to conceive of treaties that do not have an object and purpose. That's not the same thing as saying that it's difficult to find, that it is easy to find it. In fact, it is quite complex, um, given the fact that states tend to be fairly silent on the matter. I think we also need to keep in mind that uh, formulating a preamble is customary, although it's not obligatory. And we all know that preambles are not binding. They gave us a sense of why it was important to draft this treaty. Um, but other than that, um, they, they're not legally binding anyway. So the fact that a preamble is absent in itself is not worrying even if it would make the determination of uh, object and purpose easier uh, if it had been there. This concludes part one of this two-part series. The next edition features some more discussion into the theoretical and practical framework of treaty interpretation, in addition to a general conversation on the role of commentaries and specifically understanding the significance and contribution of the updated ICRC commentaries on the Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols. I hope you enjoy this episode. Keep listening to your scogans.